Hello, welcome to Beastly Theories. I'm your host, Andy McGrath. Now, joining us today is noted folklorist and cryptozoologist Ronald L. Murphy. He's a renowned speaker and the author of several books, which we'll speak about today. And several of them also cover many of our beloved cryptids. He also looks into many paranormal pursuits and uh, he's even written a, a book of poetry. I'd like to welcome to the show, Ron. How are you today? I'm doing fine, my friend. How are you doing today? Very good, and always really, really good to catch up with you. Now, oh, it's, um, it's always good talking with you. And, and just, to set, <laughs> just to set the record straight, I've actually written two books of poetry. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, in fact, when I was looking through your... Um, now, normally when I interview people, I go through a whole bio and everything, but because we know each other, sure, um, I realized I hadn't really taken a, a good opportunity to look through all of your your uh, books. I, I flicked through Amazon, and I flicked, and I flicked, and I flicked, and I thought, okay, what hasn't he written about? What can you ask him about? Catch this guy out, because he's obviously some sort of, you know, cool, bearded, hat-wearing overachiever. Okay. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, so what can you, um, what can you, what can you get on him? Now, the first one I was obviously very interested in was on wild men, searching for Bigfoot through throughout the history, uh, through history, sorry. And there were lots of chapters there that were very interesting. Now, I don't own that book. I do intend to get it. It's the first one on my list. But the first thing I was interested in, and being a, a former uh, theology student myself, actually, many, many years ago, I was going to be a priest. Uh, and, you know, um, I was too. I, uh, hmm. actually, I actually have a minor in religious studies because up until about my junior year of college, I was deciding on the priesthood as well. Oh, wow. That's, that's very amazing. Irish background, I'm guessing, with the Murphy. Maybe that's uh, the, the correlation there with both of us. <laughs> I think so, yeah. I think that's what it is, yeah. But no, I think the thing is that you and I come from a very similar, almost parallel background in a way. Um, and, I'm, and I'm very intrigued to learn, like whenever I do interviews, I like to learn about backstories because it really tells you uh, who that person is. You know, you find a lot about a person by, you know, what they've studied and what interests them. So, yeah, you know, I didn't know that about you. And then you just found out about me. So this is good. No, it, it's very good. I mean, for me personally, uh, all of my bookshelves, it's either cryptozoology, uh, theology or politics and psychology and that's those two tend to, to cross over a lot although most of the time i find if i'm on youtube or something like that it's normally uh psychology and, and politics i'm listening to most of the time and occasionally i get into a bit of cryptozoology some sort of podcast but usually it's i'm you know knee deep buried in that stuff i find it very very fascinating it also gives you um uh i also try to apply it the cryptozoology research and study because it gives you a different um, a different way of approaching you know the study of cryptozoology a, a, a different way of, of learning how to to argue the case um, right. oh, absolutely. So I try to keep the yeah. So as a writer or as a lecturer or anything, um, I like to put everything in a historical context because, you know, what we're talking about now is something that has been going on for millennia. And it's mm -hmm. interesting when we talk about wild man, like you were going to point out the chapters, you know, I, yes. I, I, I trace it back, you know, to, to the dawn of humanity, whenever people were, you know, just getting away from, you know, the fire, you know, the glow of the fire, the protection of the fire. Um, I rely a lot on uh, on uh, Carl Jung and his idea of a collective unconscious. Because I think when we are talking about things that go bump in the night, we have to go back to whenever the night meant something to us, whenever there was fear out there, you know. And there was something that it has impacted us as human beings that has left a residual stain upon who we are. You know, I, I like to say it's embroidered in our DNA. So whenever I look at things like Bigfoot or really any cryptid or any supernatural phenomenon, I like to go back as far mm. as humanly possible and see how our ancestors regarded these things. Um, and it seems if you're talking about Bigfoot or you're talking about ghosts, um, each culture has a reason for them and we mold them and they morph to become what we want them to be but they've always been with us mm -hmm. and, and when you say that do you 
do you mean that they've always been with us in our sort of fearful subconscious or we've always translated them into something supernatural or folkloric um, through our, our lack of scientific interpretation of, right. of interactions, right. for example? Well, see, that's an excellent question, and that's what we're striving to get uh, to the bottom of. But, you know, as a student of history, um, it, it seems as if we have had encounters in the past was something that we simply cannot explain today. You know, whether they're, you know, lake monsters or sea monsters or, or creatures like, you know, a bipedal ape like a Bigfoot or a, a wood wolf that you would call over there in the UK. Um, it seems as if our ancestors have encountered these things. Now, it's our job as researchers today to figure out if these things still exist or if they're just a remnant memory of, you know, who we are as people, we encounter these things. But I think without a doubt, when we talk about things like, you know, Bigfoot, um, we know that this world was populated by other creatures that were um, were uh, evolutionary dead ends, whether it's the Denisovans or whether it's the little hobbits, uh, you know, from, from Indonesia or whether it's, you know, the Gig Gigantopithecus or even the Neanderthal, for that matter, we know that we have shared this planet with other creatures that look very, very similar to us, but would make an excellent archetype for the wild man. Um, and that being said, uh, you know, they exist with us even in our DNA in some cases, like with the Denisovans and with the, uh, with the uh, 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 Neanderthals. But are they still flesh and blood creatures? And that's what keeps us going, isn't it? Well, I, I think that's that's a very good point, actually. And in this particular area, the Bigfoot area, which is has been at least for the last fifteen or so years, very very popular. I do think that it's sort of a bit of a change is coming in, in that area at the moment. But it's been very popular. There's so many different theories on what the creature could be, and and it always um, amazes me when I look at a book like on wild men this one you've you've written look at the chapters and the first thing that pops out to me is the epic of gilgamesh and then bigfoot in the bible and of course that really appeals to me so there are lots of opinions but finding them in historical text is something special i, I like the way you present that so can you tell us a little bit about the epic of gilgamesh and, and other places in the bible uh, and parts of the bible where it might be mentioned as well yeah, I remember whenever I first studied the Epi Epic of Gilgamesh, and I wasn't in high school whenever I studied this. Um, I, I, I need to point out, though, that my little guy, Ronan, who is six years old, is actually studying the Epic of Gilgamesh right now in kindergarten. I wow. kid you not. Just a very, very, you know, um, cursory overview of the of the, the, the novel, of the text. But um, as for me, I did not get a, uh, an introduction until I was in college. So I was pretty well set in my ways, and I could start examining things. Uh, you know, I was, you know, I was functioning at a higher level now. And whenever they uh, mentioned the character of Enkidu, uh, immediately it brought to mind a Bigfoot creature. Mm -hmm. I remember this girl sat next to me um, in, in this uh, in, the, in my uh, my uh, mythology class. Um, her name was Teresa. She had, you know, this this beautiful uh, Italian girl whose whose black hair hung down in her eyes and everything. Very very sweet girl. And I remember whenever they were talking about Enkidu, and I leaned over to her and I said, "I think they're talking about a Bigfoot creature." And um, the next day, she moved over to the other side of the room. But um, <laughs> you know, it, it's these kind of things though that really kind of uh, sparked my interest. Um, I had always been interested in Bigfoot since I've been a kid. Yeah. Uh, my mother would hear about Bigfoot reports and take my brother and I out looking for him. But whenever I was in college, you know, whenever I'm a grown man, an intellectual grown man, I'm sitting there in college and we, we start reading about the epic of Gilgamesh. And it's like Bigfoot walks into the room and sits beside you and says, you know, now what are you going to do with me? Um, and, and that's really what, what, what spurred me on in this is that we do see historical accounts of creatures that if you would take the, the context in which they're written about in antiquity and put it into a report now, it would almost be hard to distinguish between a contemporary sighting and an ancient sighting. So they talk about uh, the Enkidu that ran with the antelopes and drank out of the water, you know, out of the springs, uh, this, you know, this luxuriant hair that covered his body. What are we supposed to do with this, you know? And, and it's interesting that he is finally 
domesticated in a way by the encroachment of humanity. That's what happens, right? Mm-hmm. He is made to um, experience, you know, sex with 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 a, with a, with, a, with a human woman. Um, but but also, I mean, and not to go off on too much of a tangent, but whenever we talk about these wild man creatures, very um, frequently there is this sexual element to them as well. And um, with the Epic of Gilgamesh onward, we see this idea of the, the possibility of these creatures breeding with, with humans. Mm-hmm. And again, like I said, if you look at the, uh, the, uh, the archaeological record, we know for a fact that some of these, um, these early uh, hominins did indeed date with humans. You know, it, even though they went off on a dead-end path, uh, and, and became extinct, their, um, their DNA still lives on within us. You know, the Homo sapiens reigned supreme, but it, it took a time before that happened. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, Gilgamesh has all of these kind of telltale things that of, of a wild man sighting and about, uh, well, and he's not the only wild man figure in this book either, uh, in this tell. We also uh, see the, um, uh, the, another character named uh, Humbaba, who was this um, other type of hair-covered wild creature that existed in this one grove. Um, and uh, Gilgamesh and Enkidu um, encroach upon his territory. And of course, humanity, the civilized humanity, um, slays the barbaric beast, as it were. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then they again you know, exploit uh, the, uh, the natural resources. But we see this happening again and again. If you look at the 1950s in California, we don't start seeing uh, the idea of Bigfoot until humans encroach upon, you know, territory for logging and things. So, you know, whenever Shakespeare says the past is prologue, it certainly is, I think, when we talk about things like cryptids. I think that it makes perfect sense that we look back into antiquity and see if these things were still around. These aren't, Bigfoot is not a being created in 1950. Mm-hmm. Um, and neither are ghosts or any of these things. These things have been with us. Um, and whenever you talk about the Bible, I mean, you see the the, the, the talk of the Nephilim, which a lot of, especially uh-huh. a lot of ufologists make make great fuss about this because, you know, these are the, cre- the, the fallen angels, the ones that have mm-hmm. descended upon us. Um, but it's interesting to look at the actual um, – meaning of the word, uh, the fallen ones. Uh, some uh, archaeologists uh, and, and scholars suggest that fallen is not to be taken as a verb, as to fall from one state of being to the other one, but also almost like an adjective that these are lower functioning uh, humans other than us. Again, are we talking about Neanderthals? Are we talking about the Nisavans? What are we talking about here? But certainly in the Bible, we have the idea of a lesser being, a lesser human uh, again, uh, interbreeding with the the, uh, the the daughters of men, uh, and these were described as you know huge. You know, the, we in their sight were, were like grasshoppers to them. Mm-hmm. You know, so we're talking about a very very large creature, and then you have other anecdotal uh, mentions, like even with um, with uh, with Goliath. You know, what are we talking about here? Some sort of giant, and in the uh, Judaic uh, tradition, uh, it is said that the uh, Goliath uh, was, uh, I believe, he had fifty fathers or something like that. Again, the idea of this. Um, hypersexuality with these creatures uh-huh. uh, and interbreeding with uh, with uh, human beings. That's very interesting. You know, I mean, with something like Goliath and his his brothers, they are. I mean, Goliath at least is is depicted as speaking as well, mm-hmm. which would be quite right. interesting. And wearing armor. Um, I always wondered with the Nephilim, you know, the sons of God, and the Anakim afterwards, which in Hebrew just means giants or sure. Anakim, sure. Uh, the sons of Anak. If these were giant people, and additionally, we also had these Bigfoot-like creatures living alongside them, and there seems to be some sort of differentiation at points, but it's hard to pick it out That's right. in places. So with Enkidu um, or Enkidu, definitely it seems to be more of a, a Bigfoot-like creature. And, but with Goliath and his brothers, these guys seem to be more like giants. And I see what you mentioned there about when the Hebrews you know, came from Egypt back to the land of Israel or Canaan as it was then and the spies went out and came back and reported we looked like grasshoppers in the sight of these giant people it's really amazing to me something you might find very interesting at that time uh, the giant Og of the area of Bashan which is in the Golan Heights um, 
he was said to be 15 foot tall, the king of Bishan. I've actually been down into his tomb in the Golden Heights, uh, which is a, made of uh, millions and millions of carefully placed, really heavy stones um, in this concentric circles going out and out and out. In, and it's in the middle of nowhere. There's just streams and fields and flowers and frogs. That's it for miles and miles and miles around. And this was before the whole conflict was going on in Syria. And it was amazing to get down there into this tomb and think, wow, perhaps this this giant that we hear of lay here. You know, there's nothing in the tomb now. It's empty. Um, but yeah, it's amazing. Were they giants? That's right. Or were they Bigfoot? Or were they a mix of both at times? A mixture. Absolutely. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Yeah, what are we to make of this? And even like the Tel Avisa, you know, that was born with this kind mm -hmm. of uh, fur-covered body. Are we seeing the the folk memory mm -hmm. of um, the offspring of an interbreeding between one of these creatures and a human? Mm -hmm. That's very interesting. Yeah. Very I interesting. mean, I'm not saying, you know, I'm not taking the Bible fundamentally. I'm just saying that this might have been in the Judaic, you know, mindset whenever they were setting about writing, you know, this this history and they could remember of these kind of things happening in the past i think it's interesting um and but before we leave the subject before we leave the subject i wanted to point out another thing too about the nephilim uh whenever we talk about the fallen or the descendant um it's it's also um an interesting uh point that we might be talking about a race that was uh uh, not uh, worshippers of Yahweh as well, too. That's very possible that they were seen uh -huh. as soul, something that didn't have a soul. Now, in that case, they might be deemed more like an animal than a man as well. Again, this this is worthy of its own show. You know, we could easily yeah. do an hour on this to talk about the the, the meanings of these words, but. Um, because of the twenty first century, they are so obscured to this very day. Mm. I think if we look and start tearing away the, the layers of time, almost like the, the layers of an onion, when we get right down to it, um, something very strange was happening on this planet 5,000 oh, years ago. Oh, definitely. I mean, the, the Bible is not very descriptive about, you know, the, the sons of God who came down and took the daughters of men as wives and their offspring were the great men of renown of old. It's not descriptive, but it does definitely infer that they were not the same species. It, does, it that's seems right. to be a direct inference that these were different. Um, and, you know, they're supposedly punished for it as well. Now, um, you move on in the book to talk about the Greek and Roman wild men. I'm assuming that's satyrs and things oh, like sure. that. And that's, that's always really interested me, actually, because uh, it took me a long time to kind of make that connection between satyrs and uh, satyrs, sorry, and Bigfoot. So can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, and, and I, you know what? I wish that off the top of my head, I wish I remembered uh, who the uh, players were. Uh, but um, it, it, this was about 80 BC, I believe, mm -hmm. whenever there was supposedly uh, a satyr was actually captured uh, in an area of, uh, of Eastern Europe. I think it was around Romania someplace. Um, and it was taken before, you know, the general, and they talked about it being hair covered and making this terrible, terrible noise. And apparently the thing was let go because that usually is what happens in these stories. Things are captured and let go. Um, but, um, so why do we, um, show satyrs as, um, as goat figures? Because that's the thing, you know, we're, we're talking about a Bigfoot creature and the satyr, although it's bipedal and slightly hair covered, why the idea of the goat? Um, well, two things come into mind. Um, the uh, writers of this particular story said that it made, you know, the, the sound that sounded like a goat. So is it possible that satyrs are rendered in art uh, as a goat because of the sounds they make? Or because goats are said to be very lecherous animals, is it because they were, you know, so into the idea of sexuality these creatures, that that's the reason why they were rendered as half man, half goat, and hair covered. But yeah, there are actual reports in um, in the histories of the Greeks and Romans of encounters with these creatures. Um, Herodotus talks about, um, you know, Ajax's, um, uh, you know, thigh bone being on display and you know him being you know fifteen feet tall and all this stuff. So I mean, we see we still see the idea of of giants existing. Um, uh, when we leave the, uh, the the biblical world behind and we get into the Greco-Roman world. 
Mm-hmm. I know that's um, very interesting that it continues from each empire onwards. And of course, then our, our central knowledge would move on to this part of the world, uh, Europe, you know, Britain and Europe and all of the, the different legends that came out of that time and, and things like the wood woes that were depicted upon the tapestries and the churches here, you can still see them. And the woodcuts, they still exist, hundreds and hundreds of years old. And uh, you wrote a bit about the Dark Age period and the medieval period and and the creatures that were, were seen then. So talking about that, for example, do you think, does the description directly correlate each time with the satyrs of Greek and Roman history, with this big foot in the Bible, with Enkidu? Um, do you think there's a direct correlation or do you have to fill in gaps at points yeah, to, I, to make these creatures mad? Yeah, I, that's why I said I think that every generation interprets these things mm-hmm. for their own personal needs. Uh, you know, so, but whenever we get to the, the Woodwows, um, that's a very interesting character to me. Uh, even though that it's seen in church carvings and everything, uh, even in, uh, you know, illuminated manuscripts, it still seems to be the embodiment of the, the barbaric, the uncivilized, but not the personification as you would in standard literature. It seems to be a mention of something that lives out there right in the periphery of humanity. It's something that could be obtained. It's something that we could witness if we decide to leave the confines of the church or the confines of the village, you know, the confines of the state. Um, It's almost as if, you know, the woods is a rather magical place that we've left far behind. We've built up walls to separate us from them. It's become a very liminal area. And that's where the wild things live. And it's kind of like a warning to us, but in a way, it's also kind of an homage to what we left behind as well. Because whenever we get up to the Renaissance, there's a lot of times that these wild men creatures are exhibited as the noble savage, that this might be the the state we should be living in, Mm -hmm. and that we have sort of... um, uh, corrupted ourselves by taking on, you know, laws and and by you know uh, diverting our natures and everything. So they almost become, um, you know, almost a longing reminiscence about where we came from, and that might be the correct state of being. That they might all noble savage, uh, that they're existing in a sort of state of grace. They're existing in the state in which God created them, and that we have corrupted ourselves by uh, enforcing laws upon our nature and by diverting who we are as, as creative beings. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think that we start longingly looking at these creatures as something that we left behind and maybe shouldn't have. Uh, Of course, in a lot of this is cover or filling in because this is the age of exploration and there are, you know, we're starting to meet other groups of peoples Mm -hmm. and other civilizations but always in the back of the, the, the medieval and the Renaissance mind, even though we are dealing with other cultures, the wood woos and these wild men creatures are still shown as hair covered bipedal creatures and not as in like a typical um, reaction to, um, say, um, you know, a native of, of, of the, uh, the islands yeah. or something. Like that. Yeah, I, I thought that too, actually. And, um, actually, when you think about that time period in this part of the world, anyway, we weren't even aware of apes. That's right, exactly. So it makes it, I mean, there are quite a few carvings here on churches that have conical heads. Yes. Um, and that's an interesting aside. Now, one of the things that does tie in sometimes with some of the carvings here and the tapestries is um, holding a club of some kind, which actually could be a representation of uh, Hercules or Janus from the pagan period and I suppose some of the um, Christian religious interpretations of these creatures then associated with that could be more of a view a posture on paganism sure. than the creature itself and it seems to be interwoven. Now um, finally just to wrap that subject up you mentioned talking about it as a cryptid. Now that's my primary interest in all of these things of course So, as a cryptid how does it how does it stand out to you? Do, do you think it's a, it's a valid cryptid, or do you think we're talking about more of an ancient form of man that hasn't quite um, uh, re- attained 
the, the place of Homo sapiens yet? Um, see that, that that that's an excellent question, and and as I go through my research, I, it keeps on changing. Um, you know, I, I keep evolving my theory, but if I was to have to put money down on things, I think that what we're dealing with and the idea of a cryptid is as a yet discovered form of, of, of ancient man that we just simply do not have in the fossil record yet. I don't think it, I don't think it's a gigantopithecus. I don't think it has anything to do with the Denisovans. I don't think it has to do with, 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 you know, Neanderthal. I think that we're talking about another creature that had a, uh, an evolutionary dead end. If you were in that, it did not develop any kind of culture, mm -hmm. but I think that there's enough evidence to suggest that they were at least able to spread out of Asia into North America and maybe even live with us in populations of this day. Mm -hmm. I, I know that that's kind of, that's kind of like a, a rather ambiguous thing, but we're talking about ambiguity here when we talk about yeah. uh, the paranormal. There's really no way we can put our, um, our, our, our foot down and say, this is it, that this is that. Um, one other thing that I want to point out, though, about the, 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 um, the, the carrying the club, and I think that this is really what makes this so unique because you can look at this as so many different uh, perspectives. Uh, Jeff Meldrum, and I'm, you know, deeply respect, uh, re I respect him very deeply. He said that the club represented uh, the fact that the creature could not walk upright unless it needed support. Oh. So that club kind of showed it needed a cane. Now, in my book mm -hmm. uh, uh, on Wildman tracking Bigfoot through history, um, my my um, suggestion is this: we talk about these creatures um, wood knocking. Mm -hmm. Is it possible that the connection between these creatures and the sounds that they made were so interconnected in the ancient world mm -hmm. that they are shown carrying uh, the uh, the instrument by which they produce these sounds? Uh huh. Uh huh. Right. Now. Ron, it is, you go an to that amazing, level. yeah, yeah. But, but that what you just said, though, actually, it's like when um, somebody tells you the answer to a puzzle you can never figure out, and it's so simple, it seems like you should have known all uh -huh. along. That's yeah. a great. That's a really great theory because, uh -huh. of course, if they would knock, how do they do it? Well, they get a piece of wood and, and they knock. Maybe they even carry them. Lots of types of apes carry tools around with them. Oh, and we've absolutely. Seen chimpanzees. I mean, Campuchian monkeys use rocks to break right. open nuts. That's a small brained animal. So um, I think it's very possible. Very, very possible. Um, moving off from that, and I won't keep sure. you on Bigfoot all night, but it is, I think it is at least an ethno known animal. Now it's becoming ethno known. There is enough physical evidence to say something is, is going on there. Let's move on to something like the Dogman. Now, you wrote a book on Dogman as well. Now, that's very popular at the moment, Dogman, and I've covered a few stories on it. And, of course, I've always liked it because it's the one thing that makes me, uh, puts me in the position of a new believer straight away, or an unbeliever. Uh, I don't like that term, but somebody who finds something implausible. So when I talk to somebody about Bigfoot or Lake Monsters, and they say, why did I, oh, oh, yes, really? Hmm, kind of look in their face. And that's how I feel when people talk to me about Dogman. But as the sightings go along, I can't really differentiate the the um, the format in which they're delivered from Bigfoot sightings. The witnesses are the same. They seem as genuine, as frightened. So I can't discount it. What's, what's your take on it? Starting with the extensive history oh, and, yes. Um, yes. and trying to um, give it a little historical overview uh, from when they may have first appeared right up to these modern day reports in America. Oh uh, yeah. So, so let, let's, we could go back to the cave paintings. We could go to France, um, 35,000 years ago. When you see in the cave paintings, the idea of transformation, usually at a sh shamanic level, the transformation of a human into a beast. Uh, now I've never found the transformation of a 
of a human into a wolf, unfortunately. Um, I found uh, there was one called the Sorcerer's Cave, where it shows um, a human uh, becoming what looks like some sort of deer or something, an elk creature or something. And this might be used for sympathetic magic or something, you know, trying to, to, uh-huh. to help the harvest. But, and I think that the idea of the dogman is essentially linked to the idea of, of hunting. Now, my theory, especially whenever it comes to the Dogman, because this is a little bit more, I think, um, entrenched in speculation than things like Bigfoot, because you don't have that unbroken lineage in history that yeah. you would with a wild man. But um, I've always been fascinated by this era uh, in uh, human evolution called the Younger Dryas period. You, you, you know about that particular period? No. Um, we were doing pretty well as human beings. We were already doing rudimentary farming. Um, certain animals were probably, while not domesticated, at least kept close enough that we wouldn't have to hunt. Um, this is a time where um, some forms of, of religious sites were established. And then, all of a sudden, very quickly, within a decade, the um, we, we go into a mini ice age um, and it only lasts for, you know, a, a few hundred years. It's not a long-term thing, but it's enough to impact us to the point that we go from a, a, a settled community back to a hunter gatherer community. So it happens so quickly that I'm sure stories could be passed on about these kind of things. Um, and I think that it would be essential whenever we are kicked back out into the world of chaos and the world of nature that we would have to look at nature on how to survive. And I think one of those ways to survive was looking at the wolf. And I think that we've always been in competition with pack creatures. And I think that we, we are essentially intelligent creatures. We are very uh, communal. And I think we relied on the way of the wolf. Uh, in order to make our way back up that evolutionary ladder to you know become established again, but I think when we talk about things that go bump in the night, I think the younger Dryas is one of these periods that so greatly impacted who we are as um, a, a species that a lot of nightmares came from this area, from this era, because you could have your parents talking about you know what it was like to gather food while you're out hunting for food now mm. because it happened so quickly. And I, I think that this is the time whenever we started to connect into our more bestial side and we started to associate with pack hunting and things. Um, I, I have a chapter on, on this in my book. Uh, it's quite extensive and it's quite um, you know, uh, thoroughly investigated as well. But the idea of, of, of a wolf man, I think, comes to play in this particular period mm-hmm. due to the need to hunt. But this Probably would be like a shamanic, we... um, exactly. sort of perhaps right. drug-induced hunting yes. as well, where the hunters may fast and take like an ayahuasca right. type of substance, and off they go, yes. becoming yes. the animal they wish to use to hunt. So, perfect, my friend, perfect, uh-huh. because what happens then, and you know, thousands of years later, we see in the, uh, the, the, the Viking population, the idea of the berserker, you know, the bear-skinned ones. Uh, but there are also, you know, other terms, the drinkers of blood and uh, those who wore wolf skins as well, too, which is fascinating to think about. So could you imagine, you know, going back in antiquity, you know, 12, 13, 15,000 years ago, uh, and you're a small little settled village out in the middle of nowhere, and all of a sudden you're starting to become stalked by people that are wearing wolf skins very soon a part of our collective unconscious is going to perceive the idea of the werewolf you know through mm-hmm. time and everything like that things start changing things start evolving but i think that it, it it all stems from this time when we had to be very very ruthless to survive and sometimes the easiest prey out there was human beings and um and if you would assume the nature of the wolf, maybe that somehow helps your consciousness whenever you do that as well, too. Kind of like a, um, a no mercy, no fear mentality for Absolutely. Wolf, like the berserk. Uh, didn't Caligula 
um, used to dress up as a wolf in this Bacchanalian sort of orgies and commit terrible crimes and, oh. and things like that. Yes. Um, it seems to have been wrapped up in this um, magical uh, ritual for for a very long time. I wondered actually what in regards to that. So when you were looking at modern day reports of, um, or at least historically modern, you know, the last couple of hundred years, uh, reports of wolf men or dog men as they're called, how do you um, how do you extract from these floric reports factual and verifiable accounts? I mean, it, it for me when I was studying this aspect, it was very difficult to to separate the um, the supernatural, and of course, I had to then, as a you know, a religious studies uh, student, I had to think, well, actually, this could be like a a leftover remnant of that pagan period that the Christian population took forward, and therefore, then the wolf was a like a bastion of evil and evil magical practice, sure. and it's almost like a uh, a religious fable of what will happen to you if you sin. You know, the wolf man will take over you, or you will become a wolf. And Even the person says it occurs by night. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. yep. So, how do you extract from those older reports um, an actual account, something that you might think might be a realistic account of an actual creature? Um, let's look at Saint Francis for a second. Mm. Uh, the, the story of Gubbio, you've heard about the wolf of Gubbio there in Italy. Um, this town was overtaken by a very ravenous wolf that started to prey upon cattle, but then soon uh, developed a taste for the residents of Gubbio. Um, so St. Francis came, came along and actually reasoned with the wolf uh, <laughs> and said, you know, these people will not hurt you. You don't hurt them. And the people began to feed the wolf. Um, and then, um, as the story goes, the wolf was buried actually inside the church under the altar. Wow. Now, so say that this is just uh, a hagiography of, 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 you know, this saint, but we can glean some things from it. Mm. Uh, first, this wolf could be reasoned with. The idea that, that, that animals have no souls and have no mm. reason that go purely on instinct is one of the first clues that I have. Um, the second thing, and the most startling thing, is the idea that this wolf was um, was buried within a church. Uh, we have to understand, during the Middle Ages, if a baby wasn't baptized, sometimes they wouldn't even be buried mm, in a church. Right. Yeah. So, the, so I, I, again, as somebody that's pondering this, are we talking about an actual transformation of a a human being into a wolf-like creature, or are we talking about some sort of veiled attempt to talk about uh, a person that had some sort of mental illness, you know, mm. that was developed. But it seems to me that this wolf had human qualities through which um, another person could communicate and reason with. Mm. And it is not really what happens in these tales. Um, the Beast of Bedburg uh, in uh, Germany, uh, this was a man who said that he had a uh, an alliance with Satan himself, and Satan would um, transform him into an animal, and he loved to eat the fetuses out of pregnant women. That he oh killed. yeah, he, I remember this guy. Yeah, terrifying he, tales. So he also, yeah. yeah, he also killed livestock and everything. Mm. But psychologically, he was projecting himself as a wolf, mm. and I'm sure that he never transformed into a wolf. You know, so. The, the dog man is such a difficult myth, a difficult cryptid to actually get to the bottom of. Mm -hmm. So I really went throughout history and I pointed out that, you know, the, the, the Native Americans um, often depict some sort of dog man creature around their, um, their cemetery sites, their mound sites. And if you would go to Egypt... Anubis is one of these creatures that is also associated with uh, funerary sites. So we have this connection already going on. So I'm trying to make a connection throughout history of how these dogman type of things make sense. Mm -hmm. I, I will tell you one story, however, as a researcher, um, my one friend, um, she was an elderly lady, a great woman. Um, she had a little uh, uh, um, new age shop called Magical Manor great name for a little shop 
And um, a woman had come in, and she was very anxious to introduce uh, to uh, the store owner uh, her new boyfriend, who she met online. And, uh, you know, he came in, and he was very, very quiet. Um, but, um, you know, th- he, would, he would dutifully fall, uh, come along with his, uh, his girlfriend um, and while she shopped and chatted, but he never said a word. Until one time, this guy started to come in by himself. Uh, he wouldn't say anything. He would kind of loiter for a while and leave after a few minutes. But um, he and uh, the store owner developed this kind of uneasy relationship. <laughs> and he started to talk about some more far-fetched things, you know, the idea of transformation to the point that one day he came in and told her that he was indeed a, a werewolf. Mm-hmm. Now, she thought that he had some sort of problem. But sure. the more he talked about it, the more it started to make sense. He confided in her that he really loved this girlfriend uh, of his, um, but she had a young daughter, and she was he was afraid that he was going to prey upon this daughter. Okay. Uh, now, of course, from a psychological perspective, this might be some sort of proclivity towards hurting a child that's projected on this kid, you know, all this stuff. Um, but he claimed that his father was also a werewolf. Um, and it did not appear upon any kind of moon cycle, but you could feel it in your body that there was going to be a transformation coming along. And he said his father could feel it. And whenever this happened, the mother would take him down in the basement, chain him up, and leave him for a week, and then come back after the, the, the process was over because the father feared that he too would attack his family. Wow. But this woman was say, said that he felt that this was going to be coming on, and he didn't want to hurt his girlfriend's child and didn't want to hurt his girlfriend. Um, so after a time, he just vanished. He, he left. Um, a few days later, the girlfriend came into the shop and said that you know her, her boyfriend took off. She didn't know where he was at. But about a week later, he again shows up at the shop uh, and, and tells the owner that he went to one of the most um, secluded areas around here uh, it's a flood control area where very few people ever venture into. And he transformed into a wolf so nobody he wouldn't hurt anybody. Uh, but he also said while he was there, he came across a female wolf that also transformed down there. And they ran together for a week. So with all this kind of psychosexual connotations to it mm-hmm. as well. Um, but, you know, as a researcher, um, I probably get three or four reports per year of people that have seen another person transform. So are we talking about cryptid or are we talking about some sort of transformation process? It's very hard to say. Yeah, I mean, that's the difficult thing with witness reports. And yes, uh, when I first started encountering reports that I didn't accept because they were outside of my, um, my, uh, my scope of belief, so to speak, um, I was like, well, actually, what is it you disagree with about this report? It's the subject matter. Yes. Um, you're not really finding problems with the witness. Now, that particular witness you described, I think so many aspects of that can just be put down to complete you know, mental illness. Absolutely. Very clear. You can totally believe that you've become a wolf and that you met you know, other wolves that were in the wilderness where you were at, and, and you it may have you know, you may have had the same proclivity towards mental illness that your father had. Yes. And your mother would lock him up in the basement and say, well, he's turning into a wolf. And really, he was just having some sort of complete meltdown. That's which right. Which became dangerous. Yes, I think that's very plausible. Uh, but then when people tell you they've seen people turn into wolves, and that person seems completely, uh, you know, apart from the story itself, completely mentally adjusted fine as it were and that's a hard thing I have the same when people give me I think one lady one time she gave me a werewolf report and uh, part of it was it was wearing a checkered shirt and trousers and uh, had like a hat on like your hat in fact <laughs> and uh, no, that's the way she described it anyway I'm not saying it was you and um, <laughs> I mean if, if it was you should apologize because this lady was very frightened by this experience yeah, run and to me, I just could not believe it. it was, I mean, there were actually, and I've been around some men, mental illness, and there were, there were a lot of tells that she was suffering from, you know, like a psychotic episode. But apart from the small little tells that she was giving me, 
the rest of the story was quite plausible, not the subject matter, but the way it was delivered. They had those mundane details that witnesses remember when something's imprinted upon their brain. And then I realized the point actually was it had happened to her in her mind, which is why she had she didn't have any of the um, lying tells in her story, because she was relating something that she believed had taken place completely. And that was different. So how do we get those types of reports and differentiate them, especially with a subject like this, from the you know, the real deal? That's right. Um, and, and whenever I started out, you yeah. know, from the very beginning, whenever I start out in the uh, in the uh, Paleolithic and try to grab some things out of there, and we work up through the uh, the, the Neolithic, um, we are dealing with with the idea of magic we are dealing with the idea of uh man versus nature and man being part of nature as well as trying to be separated from it the 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 the, the dog man is probably the most difficult um archetype mm -hmm. to reach in and try to decipher what we're talking about yeah i would love to think that there's a cryptid out there like a dog man you know something that is formed and if you look at the pleistocene there are animals out there that very well could be taken for a dog man type of creature the dire wolf for instance that you know is popular mm -hmm. on uh, the game of thrones um that would look like a massive creature that a person probably could assume would be a dog man but the idea of the man part of it the man designation mm -hmm. is really what's throwing me off as a researcher. The bipedal The bipedal, uh, body. the intelligence and all that stuff, right? That's what's throwing me off because it doesn't appear if we're talking about a, a true-to-life creature that is, you know, a remnant from another time. That that's still the exists. point. We can't sort of pinpoint it in the fossil record right. somewhere and find its relative, can we? No. Or some no, supposed yeah. relative. And That's with right. the rest of cryptozoology, let's say, and it's a fringe sort of affiliate of cryptozoology, the dogman, with the rest of it, you can say, well, okay, maybe Gigantopithecus or, like you say, Denisovan or Paranthropus or whatever, or the Homo floresiensis, Flore can't pronounce that, for these different things, the little people, you know, the, um, the, the Sasquatch, the Almas, all these different things, then a bipedal wolf that either has wolf-like legs and stands up on them, or has a man-like body covered in hair, right. like a Bigfoot. Exactly. Very, very strange. Um, for me, it's it's a puzzler, but it's one I've had to tutor myself to say, you can't you can't exclude these people just because it makes you uncomfortable to yeah, consider right. it a reality. And now, talking about um, more supernatural things, or at least things that are perceived that way. I did catch some of you talk uh, down in Kentucky when you were speaking about the fairies, about the fae. I know that's a big passion of yours as well. It is. It is. Now, I remember when we spoke at the conference, um, I think I told you about a little chapter of my book called, it was called The uh, the Little People or the Hairy Fairy Folk. Yes. yes. And um, the reason I, I looked into that at the time is I was thinking that perhaps some of these little people reports um, might be a type of diminutive Bigfoot like the ginger deer of Australia. And I wondered, have you encountered historical reports that seem to, to match that presentation? So by fairy folk, I mean all of those types of creatures, right. not just the, you know, the, um, the, the Tinkerbells, as it were, and that people imagine right. when you say fairy. So what, what kind of things have you heard about that, that match that, that little, right. little person, hairy person um, uh, yes. description? Well, uh, two years ago here in um, eastern Pennsylvania, I live in Pennsylvania, I live in western Pennsylvania, uh, but eastern Pennsylvania has a creature out there called the Albert Witch. Have you ever heard about the Albert Witch? Mm -hmm. It means the apple snitcher, but yeah. this is about a three foot tall, hair covered, mini Bigfoot. Uh -huh. um, and um, it's seen in a very, very specific location called Chickies Rock, uh, which is right along the uh, Susquehanna River. Uh, and um, it apparently was well known with the uh, the native populations at the time, and maybe only recently went extinct. You know, within the last hundred years or so. But um, we have the Albert Witch in Pennsylvania that is still seen uh, to this very day. However, this is where it starts getting kind of uh, interesting. 
this is where the plot thickens, as my mm-hmm. mother would say. Um, a gentleman uh, by the name of Rick Fisher had sighted one on a back road. Uh, it was at his headlights. Um, he saw it. Immediately, he thought that it was a person, uh, but it was you know early in the morning. As he beca- got closer to the creature, it turned back and looked at him. He could tell that it was hair covered. Uh, it was about the size of a child, and then it just simply disappeared. Okay. Um, and such a terror came over him that he believed that this creature would be able to reappear in the car with him. So he got out of there. But this creature is seen not regularly, but enough that people know that this one stretch of road may have one of these Elbit witches roaming it. And people see it the same way, walking along the road. It, it disappears whenever people get close to it. Uh, but then I thought about these these little wild men because the the uh, the Hawaiian uh, mm-hmm. uh, population also has something called the Menahue over Menahune. there. Yeah, yeah, and these are small creatures who are also magical, aren't they? And then whenever we think about the Orang Pendek, uh, and we think about all these little hair covered many Bigfoots around the world, yeah. they all have this element of magic to them, and why? Is it because what we're seeing and these little creatures are the same thing that people had seen in what they termed the fairy folk, you know, the wee folk? Um, It's a very, very interesting thing. It's quite a a bog to have to, you know, trek through. Um, But I have always loved the idea of the elemental creatures out there. Now, this is a little bit difficult for the cryptid investigator the cryptozoologist like you and i you know you and i claim to be um (laughs) but but you know what are we to do with this because people have been talking about fairies since we had speech you know these are the things that are out there but then you know they're also able to assume other shapes and they're able to you know use glamour on you to think that you're seeing something that's actually not there so as a researcher, I'm starting to think that a lot of things that people are claiming to see might be an elemental energy that was once called the fairy. Mm-hmm. Well, it's, I think it's interesting. I think it's definitely worth um, considering that it is what it says on the tin, so to speak. It yes. A fairy is a fairy. Uh, the one thing that stood out to me about the Jundjadi of Australia was in Australia you have the Aboriginal tradition, which is quite magical, but these mm-hmm. diminutive, you know, the, the little fella and the big fella, so the Jundjadi, the, the Yowie. Um, and then you have the white people coming along, and their experience is a very matter of fact with the creature, usually. So it's strange to me, and I, I always wonder about our, our worldview the things we describe, the things that we see, are affected by a mental library. So, for instance, Loch Ness monsters and things like that are often called water horses because in the mental library of the people seeing them, well, it's got a horsey, sheepy, sealy kind of like head, in a way. That's what it reminded me of. It was like a horse, water horse. You reach into that mental library of, of the, um, the images and the names that you have and you pull something out, don't you? And... Um, I don't know, it's the same for the people that first saw gorillas. They were hairy wild men. They were the hairy wild men. They were the hairy wild men, that's right. They were the original hairy wild, you know, in this epoch of discovery. And uh, that to me says that, you know, that there is something in it. That division between the whites and the aboriginals in Australia, spiritual, supernatural, to matter of fact, makes me think that some of what we look at in our pasture in the UK with the hairy fairy folk could just be religiously inspired descriptions of these animals that we can't identify. And the same goes for their behavior too. Maybe disappearing is just you know a great form of camouflage or a very adept creature getting out of the way. So what do you think about that? Yeah, absolutely. In, in my, my book on Bigfoot, on Wild Man, whenever I, I looked at the uh, the, the uh, chapter on the wood woes, mm. it's always shown, well, it's usually always shown as two eyes and a vegetative face, you know. Mm. Look, if you lived in medieval Europe or if you lived in Europe, in England to this very day, mm. it's wooded enough that a creature that is self-aware and elusive could easily disappear into the foliage 
uh, mm-hmm. just by sinking back. You know, I mean, it, look, whenever you're out in nature, and I'm not, you know, a big hunter or anything like that. I'm out in the woods a lot. You're out in the woods a lot. And, you know, things can disappear very, very quickly. Very easy. You know, yeah. I don't think people understand how quickly, you yeah. know, a 200-pound deer can be in front of you and the next second it's mm. gone, you know. Mm. But these things do happen, my friends, and it doesn't require any supernatural abilities. You have black bear there in Pennsylvania? Oh, we do. We do, yeah. So I'm up, sure up one of those can probably pounds. sneak up on you. Oh, wow. Yeah. I'm yeah. sure one can get probably very close to you without you realizing it's there. That's right. That's right. You know what? I, as many times as I've been out in the woods, I've never come across a black bear. I, I've come across wow. uh, footprints and everything. But my dad was out hunting one time and came across a black bear and two cubs. And it's oh, one of those yeah. things where they, they basically appear out yeah. of nowhere. And then they disappear into nothingness because that's just the nature of the way, you know, these animals are. And they're all adapted for our woodland setting. And that's just what happens. We are in their their um, their backyard or there were, we're in their living room, you know. Um, so whenever I hear all these reports about these creatures disappear or they're doing rather magical things, I, I just assume that it is a witness not understanding what happened. Yeah, no, I think so. And um, that goes for anything. When uh, I always describe to people, when you're in your front room, I mean, normally use this to reference game cams, actually, but also, you know, you when you know your own backyard, you know all the nooks and crannies in your house that you can hide in. You know, when something has changed, when something has moved, it's the same for creatures that live in the forest. You know, their surroundings are recognizable to them. They're just not aimlessly wandering through the forest for whatever. <laughs> not knowing where they are. So. Not. These creatures, you know, also they, they're able to stay out of our way. And I think something that's diminished, if that's small, especially, could easily do that. In England, easy peasy. There's just so much untenanted land. And we're not an off-the-trail kind of people anyway. So we, o- we always only nearly always walk along the path. We don't stray from them. And a lot of boggy areas as well, so you have to be careful sometimes. Now, um, staying on magical... <laughs> beings as it were that just to finish up i wanted to talk about one of either two subjects and i'll let you choose either uh, vampires you know you did a book on that or mermaids oh wow yeah well we can co- we can cover both quickly okay. uh, <laughs> we'll, we'll cover both quickly so my on mermaids developed the, the first time i wrote a book on the supernatural was called The Unexplained World of the Chestnut Ridge, and it just dealt with my research in this area of Western Pennsylvania. I was never going to write another book. Uh, you know, you know, writing a book takes a lot out of you. Oh, yeah. um, it, yeah. it, it makes you mean. You don't have any family time. Uh, you don't get any sleep. Writing a book is not an easy thing to do. So whenever I wrote The Unexplained World of the Chestnut Ridge, I said to myself, that is it. That, that was a lot of work. Um, I, write, I wrote a novel before this, and I wrote a short story, a collection of short stories before this. So I had those other things published. But my first foray into writing factual documentation of research was The Unexplained World of the Chestnut Ridge. And I said, I'm done. I, I'm, re- I'm retiring from the world of writing because it, it just took so long. So my little wee daughter, Willow, came up to me one day, and she was fascinated by this this television program called um, um, H2O, which is about mermaids in Australia. And she knows that I you know, like to talk about Bigfoot and things, and she said, hey, does the mermaids exist? And I'm thinking, there, oh, geez, I never thought about this, so let me check. So I got out a couple books, and I did a couple internet searches, and I found out that wow, you are dealing with a long history mm. of mermaid sightings here as well. So the first book that I wrote in my on series was on mermaids. And that was for Willow because she asked the question and we start out at about 25,000 years ago um, in sub equatorial Africa uh, that is now desert. But at one time, you know, the sea came quite close mm. and, um, and there are representations of what appear to be mermaids uh, scrawled on uh, as rock art. So, you know, what are we supposed to do about this? So as I started looking at it, you know, some scholars suggested that we were dealing with swallows. And by the time we get up to the Greek world, mermaids are, you know, these always associated with birds and sometimes even portrayed, portrayed as having wings, you know. So 
it became a very convoluted thing to find out exactly what a mermaid is. And, you know, people will ask me today, do you believe in mermaids? And I point out that they probably bought their coffee from a mermaid that morning. So it's not <laughs> really for me to try to convince them that they exist because they certainly <laughs> exist in our vernacular. You know, they are part of our culture. Yeah. Who we are. Yeah. But every day, well, not every day, you know, every year, um, mermaid sightings are occurring. I, I talked to one person. Oh, really? They're, they're, oh, yeah. They are modern sightings. Oh, uh, in Israel uh, of all places. I know that you're oh, affinity really? towards Israel. But yeah. uh, at, at one point, about four years ago, there was actually um, uh, a bounty set up if somebody could bring back uh, proof of, of a mermaid because there was one scene over there. So, what, of, of course, it may have been an off course, uh, you know, a seal that got off of its, uh, mm. its, its course and stuff. And I'm sure that that's probably what happened because we really, as human beings, want these things to exist. Yeah. Um, but uh, but fairy or but uh, mermaids also have that correlation with fairies as well because when we look at the work of Paracelsus, he said that the undines and the, the these mermaid creatures were the elemental controls of the watery realm. So again, we talk about fairies again because you know you have to have something to personify these particular things of nature, and what better way to personify the the world of the water than a, a beautiful female that's half fish? Mm, of course. And do you think that maybe psychologically uh, we may have uh, interposed human characteristics or all the aspects of nature that we're fearful of? Water, the woods, you know, the skies, and every everything has this human characteristic or humanoid characteristic. So we can identify with it. Now, sure. and I, that's a theory I have, but I don't really think that it's... It's set in stone because people, as you say, are still describing these mermaids. Right. Right. And right. we have to give that the same credibility. Now, talking about vampires, that to me, whenever I think about vampires, it's it's cannibalism, right? It is. You think of it. If they're cannibals, only they, they're, they're drinkers, not eaters, right? That's right. So That's for me, right. it's the same. And nobody ever, I never got why it was such a romantic uh, sort of you know, emo gothic romantic style um fantasy for some people because essentially it's a cannibalism fantasy you know so w tell me what you know about that you know are these creatures that actually um come from some folklore about bats or about strange animals that are preying upon people or is this more again some kind of pagan or pseudo satanic practice that people have carried out um the writing my book on vampires was just as difficult as writing my book on on werewolves on on dogmen. Um, again, I start out in antiquity. I, I start out actually uh, during the uh, the Paleolithic, and I start out in England of all places. Um, uh, you know, when we go back, you know, fifteen eighteen thousand years ago, um, England was 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 called. Um, the land of the living dead, because there were more people dying than that were being born. You know, so the people that were that were on the island of of, of England, they were not in a good situation, my friend. Um, but there's a site uh, at at the Cheddar Gorge, mm -hmm. uh, a place called Go's Cave, G O U G H. I pro I assume yeah. it's pronounced Go. I know it. Um, I know. Yeah. It. Oh, you, you have you been there? I used to live in Bristol. So uh, oh. I've not been to the cave, but I, I know Cheddar Gorge, and I, I know where it is. Right. Well, I think that this, as a researcher, I will say that I think that we found the first layer of what we would call vampires, and I will tell you why. Oh. Um, there was an archaeological excavation there not very long ago, and um, they uncovered um, basically a processing room. Where all the animals were processed, you know, and, and cleaned of their their hide and everything, because we can tell by what was worked upon the bones. And we find a lot of antelope, a lot of deer, a lot of a lot of megafauna that would have existed on, uh, on in England at the time of, of the Ice Age. Um, but among those bones, not separated from those bones, but among those bones were um, uh, three humans. Um, and also excavated within that cave was, um, I believe it was two um, cups fashioned out of a human skull that had the residue of human blood in it. Yeah. Uh, again, we go back to the idea of the dog, of the, the, the dog man, the werewolf. Human beings are very 
easy prey. Mm -hmm. If you are relying on killing a human being to survive, cannibalism is one of those skeletons in the closets we don't like to talk about. But that's absolutely what was occurring in England at this time. And I'm sure in other parts of the world, this was very difficult for us <coughs> as human beings to survive. We don't want to talk about us preying upon each other. So we have to disguise it in some way. And we have to call it werewolves or we have to wear the mask of the vampire yeah, because vampire. we don't want to. Yeah. Yep. <coughs> so it's a lot easier to think that there's a creature patrolling the night than to think that we have that within us to be able to do such heinous crimes. Now, I do have a chapter in that book upon about things that might be cryptic vampires because Greece has this, in Greece, there's an idea of a vampiric creature that is covered in hair and lives in caves, almost like a baboon type creature that will come out and feed upon the blood of people. And of course, in, um, in the, um, like the Philippines, there are tells of these giant bats that would also feed upon human blood. So That's if like, we, yeah. yeah, so if we want the idea of a cryptid involved in vampiric um, behavior, that's easy enough to find, my friend. We can find that out there in nature. But I think when we talk about the vampire, this is not a romance. This is not something that's glittering. This is us having to wear the mask of a, of a yeah. monster because we had to do very monstrous things to survive. Mm -hmm. No, I, I would agree with that, actually. I, I think, obviously, there must be many unexplained cases out there that people have reported. And again, you know, they have to be given their credibility where it's due. Generally speaking, it does seem to be, you know, a, a form of cannibalism. Interesting point, side point actually. The um, the name for a Jewish priest, Cohen, um, or one of the derivative names, Cohen, is actually part of the the word cannibal. So some of these old priests of Baal, Baal, the god, the Babylonian god, that was passed through these generations, and some of the Jews were worshiping when they disobeyed. Baal, the Cohen of Baal, Carnabal. That's where. Wow. It See, yeah. I did know the idea. I, I did know the notion about Cohen, Cohen being the person yeah. that could be a priest. Uh, priest. But I had no. That is fabulous. And, and yeah. if we think about that as well, too, you know, we think that we live in a society that is pretty well, you know, where we, 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 we're, we're involved in a religion that is not all. You look at the Judaic, uh, uh, you know, foundation it was all blood you know that's how god proved himself and how we proved ourselves to god um of course we have uh you know um uh some of the prophets rallying against that you know do you think really god really wants yeah. you to do this but oh, yeah. it was part of who we are right our psyche i don't think it was god telling us to slaughter animals but we as human beings wanted that didn't we i think it's it's very i mean obviously there's there's very intricate religious reasons uh, with original sin and all these sort of things for the, the slaughter of those animals that I, I'm not really qualified to speak about um, all these years after finishing that degree. <laughs> but um, I do think it's it's very interesting that for some reason blood is always required. So God right. required of the Jewish people that they would propitiate uh, their sin with a, a unblemished animal to stand in their places that sacrificed uh, the Christians interpreted uh, that Jesus being their Messiah, the Son of God, was this perfect sacrifice once for all, so no more sacrifices needed. And you could say from a pagan point of view, or these particular pagans who were committing cannibalistic um, practices, that they were also making a blood sacrifice to their God, which was required. So it's a perversion of it in a way, or from our perspective, from this perspective, we would say it was a perversion of it, um, of the, the tradition, but still, blood is needed it's to needed. make everything right with the gods, and that's a, that's a very interesting perspective that affects all of humanity. And I think that's why you have things like cannibalism spread out throughout the world, or different types of animal sacrifice, more appropriately, spread out everywhere because we all have that one thing in common. No, we we do, we do. Uh, we are um, one of the most beautiful points of creation we're, we 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 are you know again to point to shakespeare you know a little less than angels uh -huh. um but we can also do the most devastating things as well too oh, yeah. and and we don't want to admit that we're capable of doing those things no and yeah and then you see that's whenever 
werewolves start prowling about. And that's whenever <laughs> vampires start tapping at your window. Yeah. Uh, yeah, because I they, they yep, I, I do too. And you know what? And I think that whenever people turn into podcasts or read books, they want to see a litany of sightings and they want to talk about all this kind of stuff. But my friend, unless you and I are talking about these points of view, mm-hmm. We're never going to get to an answer of a Loch Ness monster, or oh. we're never going to get to the answer yeah. of a Bigfoot. We have to cover all of these things in order to get to the heart of what might actually be out there. We have to talk about uh, philosophy and psychology, and we have to talk about all this kind of stuff if we are actually going to think that there's something out there. You know, that, that's Definitely. just the way it works. Yeah, you have to, because um, otherwise, essentially, we're just entertaining fantasy without sure. any proof. Uh, but right. I do think that the answer eventually will be like your, your, um, you know, Bigfoot depictions with the club, in that <laughs> it will seem so simple that it should have been obvious all along when that answer finally comes, and that's where I am. Now, just very quickly before you head off, and I, now I ask everybody this question, which is, if you could go on any expedition anywhere in the world, on his no object to find any cryptid, um. And choose any two people to go with you, either alive or dead, from history, okay. uh, researchers. Where would you go? What would you search for? And who would you choose? Wow, this this is awesome. You know, I, I will tell you, I would go on any expedition that involved you. Because I think that you're just <laughs> one hell of a guy. You're the most genuine human being around. And I love to hear you talk because you can talk about so many things. So I would say you. And then um, I'm this trying to think of some object. <laughs> But uh, no, no. Um, you know, I like my buddy Brian Bowden a good bit. You know, I, and I have a radio nice. show, yeah. and we we would probably have a lot of fun together. Um, so I would I would say the three of us would go out, and um, wow, this this is a, this is a good question. Yeah, and it, it might be boring for you, but you know, I really have an affinity towards the United Kingdom. I really do. No, um, I think. Me. We would I, go up I, to I Abra- look at it. I'm very comfortable with this situation. <laughs> Let's go up to Sterling. We would go up to Sterling in Scotland. Okay. Uh, we would investigate Reverend Kirk up there because, you know, he was the one that wrote about the Commonwealth of the Fairies. Um, and let's just start investigating fairy lore uh, in that area, which would take us to Loch Ness and the idea of this kind of water horse. And we will just ride this thing out. That's great. That sounds I awesome. That would be me. a good thing. I would think that would be a good thing. <laughs> um, you know, um, I, I've been a fan of yours for a while. I've been a fan of yours since before um, before I met you, of course. Um, because the way you 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 try to bring everything together, especially in something as epic as talking about cryptids of the United Kingdom, um, the way you do it to try to bring in all the elements, the natural elements as well as the more you know supernatural elements, is is a very difficult undertaking, and and you do it brilliantly, and that is one of the reasons why I'd like to be with you on your next expedition. Hopefully, our paths cross very very soon. I think um, you will. You've done a lot of conferences. I've done a lot of conferences, and there are people there that are just wide eyed, and they really don't understand the history of this. And they really are going on just what people talk about. And they make for great entertainment. Mm -hmm. But whenever it gets down to the research, there's very little research that's going on. Mm -hmm. And I really do applaud you as a researcher. The same way with Lauren Coleman. I really like Lauren Coleman as as well. Ken Gearhart is one of my favorite researchers Uh out there. Um, Jeff Meldrum. There's a lot of good people out there. Mm -hmm. But I don't think that they are being given as much headlines as the more... Um, sensational folks out there, and I think that yeah. does need to change. Yeah, yeah. but I think you know, life is like that. that um, we yes. like simple um, solutions. So people who pull in, it's it's pop music. Pop it music is. will always be the most popular, but it's not the best music. It's not just the, the most music. popular. Yeah, that's true. Ron, you've been absolutely awesome as always. I advise everybody to go check you out. And now, where should they find you on on Facebook or I know if they go yeah. to Amazon, they can find all your books. But uh, social media wise, where where should we find you? Yeah, you know, um, Facebook is really the place that I I, I go to all the time. I, I love the idea of social media. So you can look up uh, Ronald Murphy Jr. There. Um, I have a couple sites. I have my own personal site, which I have no problem friending anybody. I have no problem at all. But um, I think I'm close to the the limit on friends. So if you go to my 
author site. We can still chat over there as well, too. Mm-hmm. But so, yeah, look up Ronald L. Murphy Jr., I think, would be the whole thing to go for. Um, and if you do want one of my books, I have no problem. Um, you know, you know, we can talk. I can sign it for you. You know, you don't have to order it from Amazon. I can probably even give you a better deal than Amazon offers as well, too. But I think That's it's important it. for us people in the field, uh, us researchers, to really open up a dialogue and network with people. So please, you know, get in touch with me. I look forward to talking. Even if you think I'm a complete idiot, I would love to talk <laughs> See what you know. What you got to say about it? Yeah. Well, you know, I, I've been I've been uh, given a few of those home truths myself by by some people, out there, but I'm always open to take it. And occasionally, oh, on certain right. subjects, the person um, assailing me, however um, uh, virulently, has been right. I've had to put my hand up and say, you know what, you're right about this. That's right. It wrong. Yeah. One, it of wrong. The, one of the best reviews I ever had on Amazon was uh, on wild men and it was a two-star review and the guy said if i wanted to uh to read a college textbook i would have went to college that made me feel <laughs> awesome, even though it was a horrible review but yeah i actually felt good about that <laughs> <laughs> it's a, it, it hurts it's when it's true but you know um yeah, well yeah that, that but that just shows where he was when he was that's looking right for um, I, I've stopped answering in snipey, snappy ways though, because sometimes I can't resist the urge to get a bit of sort of dry sarcasm in the in the response, and I'm always just being lighthearted. I never mean it to to be aggressive in any way. But of course, text can be so easily misinterpreted, so um, I've stopped doing it now. But um, you know, occasionally I have said, "Well, unfortunately, you know, because you failed to get in touch with me before I wrote the book, I was unable to accommodate your needs." in yes. you know, your reading requirements and all well, question mark you know and I, I'm, I'm staying away from that snipey kind of thing now because it's not really in my personality but occasionally i can't help but bite <laughs> I stop that's right myself. sometimes you have to sometimes yeah. sometimes there's enough bait out there you just have to take a nibble but only if it seems like it's going to be good fun ron yes. thank you so much i'll say goodbye and um I advise everybody to check out your books, check out your Facebook page, and bye, bye, bye. It's really awesome. Hey, thank you very much, my friend. It was a pleasure being on here with you. Thank you. Bye.